members and advise members of the need to maintain social distancing during the meeting. Um, I'd also like to welcome to our committee uh, Mr Jim McManus, uh, an Assistant Assembly Clerk here with the committee. We'd like to thank Vincent for the hard work that he has done uh, in a, a difficult time as well. So we're looking forward to helping Jim along on the team to help and support as well. So today uh, I would like to provide a brief overview of the day's business. So the committee will consider subordinate legislation, a departmental briefing, update on MOT and driver test backlogs, assembly research briefing, motor test structures in other countries, uh, and the committee inquiry into decarbonisation of road transport in Northern Ireland. Can I advise members that due to, witness, uh, due to witnesses and some members joining the meeting remotely, that it would be helpful if members use the hand up icon to register that they wish to speak or ask questions at each agenda item. Also, if members and witnesses could mute their mic when they are not speaking, that would allow everyone to hear the evidence and follow the meeting. Could I also advise members of the need to vacate the room by uh, 1 p.m.? At the latest, uh, I request that members keep that in mind when asking questions. So we do have apologies this morning. We have an apology from Andrew Muir. Have I any other apologies in the room? We don't. Uh, I move now to sorry. Apologies from Patrick Delarge. Okay, Apolog apologies for Patrick. Okay. Uh, could I also move now to uh, agenda item number two, which is chairperson's business? And can I advise members that the committee has been invited by the Agriculture Committee to an event being run by Sustrans to familiarise members with e-bikes on Wednesday, the 10th of November, 2021. The committee has been allocated a slot of uh, 12:45 to 1:30, and I propose to end the meeting in time to allow members the opportunity to attend here at Parliament Buildings. Committee staff will issue consent forms to members who wish to attend. Are members agreed with that action point? Great. 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 Thank you, members. I'm going to move now to agenda item number three, uh, which is uh, draft minutes. Can I turn members' attention to page six of the draft minutes of the meeting on the 20th of October 2021? Are members content that the minutes are a true and accurate reflection? Agreed? Great. Great. Thank you, members. Okay. Thank you. Can I now move to agenda item number four, which is matters arising? Can I turn members' attention to page 15, matters arising from the meeting on the 20th of October 2021? Can I ask members if they have any issues arising from the meeting? No issues. Uh, and can I turn their attention to page 19, which is the outstanding committee request for information for noting? Okay. I'd say no, no request. So we'll move now to agenda item number five, which is correspondence. And can I draw members' attention to page 25, the correspondence memo, uh, at pages 57 and 128, the minister's response to the committee questions from its meeting on the 6th and 13th of October. Uh, does any member have any points they wish to raise within the correspondence memo? Uh, I see Liz Kimmins hands up, Liz. Thanks, Chair. It's just on page 62 there, the one regarding Cara Crop and Hill in Camla. I had raised it um, at committee a few weeks ago. Um, the, the Minister's responded to say she's not aware of any unanswered correspondence. It was actually um, my colleagues, Conor Murphy, MLA, and Councillor Una McGuinness had both written to the department in relation to this, and neither have had a response to date. So if we could maybe follow up on that or um, and try and get a response as quickly as possible. Okay. Uh, your point's been noted. Thank you, Liz. Um, I turn members' attention to page 66, which is a copy uh, of the Queen's University Belfast Open Botanic uh, Report on Active Travel and Healthy Street Strategy for Botanic Avenue Belfast and an offer to brief the committee. Members may wish to write to the Minister asking her how the report is being integrated into her vision for the Belfast plans. Are members content with that action point? Agreed. Agreed. Agreed yeah. Thank you, members. Okay, could I turn members' attention uh, to table at page three, which is an invitation from your table papers, invitation from TransLink to an event to preview the first of the 80 new uh, zero emission electric double decker buses. The event, however, takes place during the committee meeting next week. I think that's quite regrettable uh, that that has happened. Um, I think there has been a uh, correspondence back and forward from the committee in relation to that. So, uh, look, I I suppose probably in relation to this, I, I would recommend that we go back as a committee, expressing our disappointment that it's happening during the committee meeting, and that if alternative arrangements could be made in the future, that the committee would like to visit to see this uh, at TransLink. Are members content with that? Yeah. Great, Great, sure. content. Yes, sure. And can we also uh, uh, 
advise TransLink, just in case they're not aware that the committee <laughs> does meet uh, on Wednesday mornings? Yeah, no, I think I think that's a point well noted. I think, uh, given their interactions with the committee in the past, they should be well aware of that point. Going ahead, Cathal. Actually, yes, a wee bit disappointing because I mean, a lot of us, as not only as part of our work, but we've we'll been interested in, and, and certainly we'll, we'll have to follow up. But we need to keep in mind in future yeah. any events, you know. Okay, Liz, is your hand still raised? Or are you looking in this point? Okay, that's it. Okay, so the points are noted. Members are content with actions as suggested in the correspondence memo. Are we agreed? Great. Great. Thank you, members. We now move on to agenda item number six, which is subordinate legislation. SL1 is not subject to assembly procedure. Can I advise member that there is one proposal for a statutory rule not subject to assembly proceedings at page 134. Uh, SL1, the traffic weight restrictions, Claddy, Northern Ireland Order 2021. Are members content with the proposal for the statutory rule? Content? Great. Agreed. Thank you, members. Agenda item number seven, which is subordinate legislation. SR is not subject to assembly proceedings. Can I advise members that there is one statutory rule not subject to assembly proceedings? There has been no changes to the policy content since the SL1s were considered by the committee on the 13th of October. At page 138, SR 2020 290, the Road Races Ulster Rally Order, Northern Ireland 2021. Can I advise members? Uh, to note this, uh, or ask members to, uh, to note the statutory rule on this, they have any issues to raise on the proposals. Are members content with the statutory rule? Content? content. Thank you, members. Okay. We will now uh, move members to agenda item number eight, which is our departmental briefing for today. It is an update on MOT and driving test backlogs. I um, will also uh, indicate that Hansard will record the meeting and turn members' attentions to page 147, which is a departmental briefing paper from the Driver and Vehicle Agency, MOTs and Driving Tests. And we do uh, have officials with us this morning, so I'll wait for them to take their seat. Okay, members, can I take the opportunity to welcome uh, Mr. Jeremy Logan, Chief Executive, Driver and Vehicle Agency, and Mr. Pat Delaney, Director of Operations, uh, Driver and Vehicle Agency. Can I say, gentlemen, uh, thanks very much for coming along to the committee again. Uh, we know this is not the first time, but this is an active area of interest for the committee and indeed for the Assembly in general. So I welcome you to the committee today, and I'd appreciate at this stage if I could hand over to you to talk us through your briefing this morning, which will be followed by questions from members. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you for your invitation to come to the committee today to provide an update on DBA services. We have provided a briefing paper for the committee in advance of today's session, and I will draw out a few points from the paper uh, about the current position. As is the case with many other public-facing services, COVID-19 has had a significant impact on DBA services, particularly vehicle uh, and driver testing. We continue to review our risk assessments in line with the latest public health advice, guidance and regulations to ensure the safety of our staff and customers. In terms of MOT services, from the 26th of July, we returned to our normal vehicle testing times and our capacity has significantly increased as a result. We are, however, experiencing a significant demand for vehicle testing services, which has meant some customers will not be able to get their vehicles MOT'd before their current certificate expires. As committee members will know, we have consulted with the PSNI and the Association of British Insurers to make them aware of the current position, and both parties have agreed to adopt a pragmatic approach to support motorists who find themselves in this position. It is worth repeating the key message to owners that it remains their legal responsibility to ensure their vehicles are maintained in a roadworthy condition to be used on a public road. This is the expectation of DVA, the police and insurers. Motorists should also ensure their vehicles are checked and prepared before they are presented for MOT. They should not use the MOT as a means to identify any defects on their vehicles that need repaired. In respect of driving tests, we have focused on maximising our resources to help meet the high demand for this service since it resumed on the 23rd of April. A similar demand for driving test service exists in GB in Ireland. From the 23rd of April to the end of September, we have delivered over 30,000 driving tests, primarily using additional resources and overtime to help meet the demand. We will continue with our recruitment processes to bring in and train additional driving and vehicle examiners to help meet the demand going forward. Although it should be noted that the shorter hours of daylights will limit the number of tests an examiner can conduct each day. 
while working hard to increase our capacity for both driving tests and vehicle tests. We have also introduced a new, more user-friendly booking system, which went live on the 22nd of September. We have experienced some technical issues with the new system, and we have worked tirelessly with our IT partners to resolve these and improve system performance for everyone. I am pleased to advise that in little over a month since the system was implemented, the vast majority of customers are able to book their tests online, benefiting from the easy-to-use screens with clear guidance on how to complete the booking process. I must also take this opportunity to thank all DVA staff for their dedication and efforts to deliver services safely through the pandemic and also to progress work to enhance services for all customers. We are happy to take any questions you may have today. Okay, thank you for your presentation, Jeremy. Um, it's much appreciated to the committee. There's obviously been a lot of commentary surrounding DVA and the, the current backlogs that exist. Uh, notwithstanding, and the committee recognise and appreciate that there has been a, a significant rise in tests in terms of even if we look across the five-year average for those months. Could I ask, could you give us a very factual position in relation to what the current backlog is uh, as of today, or the nearest point to it for both MOTs and driving tests at present? Chair, it's very difficult. We've had this conversation before at committee in terms of identifying the backlog, and our focus has been to maximise the amount of tests we delivered. And it's good to acknowledge that um, you know it is recognised the amount of effort that has gone on to increase um, the number of, of tests that we have conducted, both vehicle tests and driver tests. Um, we are booking out um, driving tests um, now into March. Um, the bookings for March um, were released at the start of this month. And uh, I think there was something like 2,600 tests um, that were made available, and of those, there remains, um, you know, over 1,000 tests that are still available for customers uh, to book into. Uh, and obviously, things change on, on a regular basis as resources become available, and we flush more driving tests and indeed vehicle tests into the system uh, for booking. Uh, but to try and identify. Um, a sort of a backlog figure is almost impossible. Um, we would have historically looked at uh, our waiting times in terms of how long did it take a customer to book a, a vehicle test and indeed a driving test uh, as, a, as a barometer of, of you know, the length of time anybody had to, to wait to avail of those services. And as we've switched over to a new booking system, we are working closely now with uh, our provider Fujitsu to develop that suite of management information that allows us to more accurately predict the demand for services going forward uh, in terms of waiting times. But I can assure the committee that every effort is being made to deliver um, both the driving tests and vehicle tests with the resources that we have available, and we are utilising and continue to utilise uh, over time. Um, uh, and we're continuing with our recruitment process to bring more staff in in both of those areas of work. Okay, and I suppose uh, probably the committee would be very interested to know the technological advancements which are enabling you to, to better predict what the backlog will be and how the NDVA can act in an appropriate way to ensure that, that we're eating into that. Is there any particular areas across the country which are of considerable concern or should the committee be aware of as to um, challenges in particular testing areas? Uh, and therefore, is there a broad average across the board? Or are we seeing difficulties in particular testing areas? Well, the monthly figures that we produce, um, which, because of the interest obviously in the services, show the tests that are delivered across each test centre. And, and obviously, that is a, a logistical challenge for us to ensure that where there is, is pockets um, through maybe absence of examiners in particular areas, that we uh, utilise the resource across the network uh, to ensure that there is. Uh, adequate numbers of tests being delivered in each geographical area. So we do look at those figures, and where there's pressures in areas, then we will move resource to support, um, you know, the delivery of services in, in those particular areas. I mean, certainly the figures which suggest that you know they you know it's, it's it's pretty even delivery across the network. Um, but suffice to say, it remains a challenge across the network to utilise our resource. Uh, and make sure we're pointing them to the areas where um, you know issues do arise, and we have to react and respond very quickly to that. Okay, and, and in terms of vehicle examiners, what was the pre-pandemic number of examiners in, this, in, in within DVA? The pre-pandemic number, what well, we've I made mean, at the current position, we have 38 full-time examiners and 43 dual uh, role driving examiners. And as we've uh, advised the committee before, we're in actively recruiting additional uh, vehicle examiners and driving examiners. Um, indeed, the driving examiner, the next tranche, um, are being brought forward for training uh, for, for next next week. 
and indeed uh, shortly after the vehicle examiners will come in for the next tranche of training. So um, we are actively, you know, uh, sort of swelling the numbers of, of driving examiners and the dual role examiners that we have to provide the flexibility we need across the service to deliver both driving tests and vehicle tests. And I suppose as we move into uh, the darker months, we have um, put our dual role examiners out front um, throughout the summer period to maximise the number of driving tests we delivered. And now we have to try and find the, the balance that allows us to deliver driving tests and also then focus on the MOT testing side. And those dual role examiners have always provided that flexibility, which is unique to the agency, to allow us to, to manage the demand in both of those uh, significant areas of work. OK, and just for, for clarity, so you're saying the current number is 38 full-time and 43 dual. Is that correct? Well, actually, the 38 full-time examiners has probably increased. <laughs> Literally, um, uh, last week there was another two examiners that uh, went through their training successfully, so we're now up to 40 full-time driving examiners. So it's actually, it's 39. One of our examiners has retired, so the 40 has now reduced back to 39. Okay, so 39 and 43 dual. Yep. That's current. Do you have a figure for what pre-pandemic numbers were? The pre-pandemic numbers were less than that. Um, the the highest figure we ever had for dual exam for driving examiners, which was a combination of full time and dual role, was 90. Okay. So we're we're actually approaching that number. And when we had 90 uh, driving examiners, we were doing 75,000 tests per year. So we're increasing that the, the number of examiners that we have, so that we we have the capacity to reach that number. Um, before the pandemic, we'd have probably been looking around 35, 35 uh, in terms of the balance. Yeah. So, sorry, just to, to clear up on that one, Pat. So, um, if we look at, say, as 39 and 43 dual, that would be in around 82. Yeah. Uh, and you're saying pre pandemic, we had in the region of 90. 82 with 70. Before, pre, before pandemic, we're around about 70. 70, okay, yeah. sorry. I but the up highest that. number we ever had was, around, it was 2008 when we had okay. 90. Okay. And that's when, when driving tests were at their very highest, 75,000 okay. a year. And do we have a brief figure on sickness and absentee levels at present? Yes, um, we, we are st struggling uh, with sickness absence in, uh, in the agency. Um, we, we have a number of our staff who have very, very serious uh, illnesses. And we have a number of staff who are out with long COVID. And we have um, a number of staff who are currently either have COVID or have been pinged as uh, close contact. The last figure I had for our vehicle examiners was around 15% of our of our staff were impacted by sickness. Okay, uh, I'll come I'll come on to you now in a moment, Roy. Okay, that's and my final question for, for for me on the the MOT question uh, would certainly be in relation to um, vehicle tests. You know, can you explain how the reduction of vehicle test times has been achieved? What has been the main success point in, in achieving that? Um, <clears throat> The main success, how do we achieve the reduction in vehicle tests? We have returned the vehicle test time to the pre-pandemic vehicle test time. Um, so th that's how we've reached normal vehicle testing times. Um, our health and safety risk assessments, um, whenever we commenced testing um, uh, after COVID, we had a vehicle test time of 30 minutes. And that was to allow social distancing. The customer wasn't in the vehicle. It was to allow for you know, hand washing, hand sanitizing, um, and for um, other issues related to COVID uh, in terms of the number of staff that we could have in the, in the workplace at the one time. Um, as we have um, progressed through the pandemic, we have been able to reduce the test times gradually. So we reduced it from 30 minutes to 25 minutes, and then from 25 minutes to 20 minutes. Now, the important thing to remember here is that there has been no diminution whatsoever in the test itself. Mm. All, of the, all of the items of the vehicle that need to be tested have been tested, are being tested. It's just that we, we lengthened that time to accommodate the measures that we needed for, for COVID. So we've now managed to get back to our pre-COVID test time of 20 minutes per vehicle. Okay. And have we any figures on, in relation to driving tests regarding outstanding or re requests? I think one thing that has continually come up, and I would uh, encourage DVA to, to look at this, as has been mentioned by other members, is that if somebody does fail a test, they're automatically put out uh, of the system and have to reapply. I, I think there is a, a certain issue there because it's not, it's not just in relation to having to be thrown out of the queue to then go to the back and into the, into the new year, but it's the time in between and the lack of conf confidence uh, and, and test and costs that, 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 that's involved to bring somebody up to a standard which perhaps uh, they were very close on, but due to nerves or something on the day, 
unfortunately failed their test. Has there been any attempt to, to look at that particular issue? I suppose I mean it, it is a, it's an issue again. I know that has been raised before, and it's a difficult one because when we were resumed, we uh, our testing we prioritised um, testing for those um, that who had been waiting the longest, and based on theory test expiry dates, to give them an opportunity to book a test for uh, other uh, customers were able to avail of the booking service. And you know the difficulty is yes, some people do fail, and there's a variety of reasons why they fail. It could be nerves, but it could be that they're not prepared for their test, and indeed uh, many uh, candidates will fail more than once and it's trying to find a balance between the opportunity that you provide someone who has had an opportunity to do the test failed once failed twice mm -hmm. for someone who has not had an opportunity to do a, do a test um, so our, our, our view was that we should open the booking service it's not that you go back to the the, the back of the queue you then avail of the booking as any other customer would you avail of whatever slots are available at that point of time so you're you're basically the same opportunity as anybody else to book a test at that stage if you fail a test so it has been um, you know certainly a difficult uh, area uh, for, for consideration but we felt it was for us to give everybody the opportunity given the fact that we had allowed those um, uh, access to the booking system uh, before others to get a test booked and, and have the opportunity to take the test in the first place. Is there an ability perhaps to maybe look at those um, repeat testers uh, that perhaps they could be first in the list for cancellations uh, as opposed to the wider pool of people given taking into account that they have been in a system uh, but unfortunately through many reasons may have failed. Is there an ability to do that type of uh, there, 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 there is. There, there's always a way of doing something if you're minded to do it. Um, the difficulty is, is that, and, and I can see your point in terms of people who narrowly uh, fail the test. But I see the outcomes of people who fail the test, and a lot of those people um, have booked the test in the hope that they would pass, rather than the expectation that they would pass. And some, some of them have failed poorly, uh, and some of them, and quite a number of them, have in fact. Um, uh, had a serious error within the first 10 minutes mm. of the test being conducted and we've had to return them to the test centre okay. or we've had to terminate the test in the middle of the test and abandon it because they're not, they're, they're not ready for the test. Okay. And those people are actually preventing people who have um, spent the time and the money to be prepared from getting an actual driving test. And I would encourage people who are um, preparing for the test to take our advice, and the advice is on NI Direct, you know, do not book your test until you are ready to do the test and you have an expectation of passing the test. At the moment, there just seems to be a little bit too much speculation um, in terms of someone's ability to pass the test and, and they're, they're failing and they're failing badly. Okay. Okay, and finally for me is obviously budgetary. Um, the Minister in the October Monday round, the Department did have a bid for DVA in particular for £8 million, uh, for COVID costs and, and loss of revenue during the COVID period unsuccessful in that bid. Uh, I did raise that in the, in the Assembly Chamber. Could you maybe outline to the committee uh, the difficulties now that, that maybe present themselves to DVA as a result of COVID costs and perhaps trying to address now the backlogs in terms of additional examiners and costs associated with overtime, etc., and how that is maybe impacting DVA's surface, service going forward? I leave the hard question to Jeremy. <laughs> Well, we continued, um, obviously, to monitor our, our budget very, very closely. Um, I suppose the good news is, at the end of, of, of last financial year, you know, we were successful with our COVID bids, which were much more substantial than this year, uh, to the tune of £31 million, and that uh, left us with a healthy cash reserves position at the start of the year. So, yes, the pandemic has still had an impact on the services that um, we have been delivering this year, and primarily in terms of lost fee income through vehicle testing. So we estimate that to be in the region of 5.3 million. And what makes up the 8 million then is the additional cost that we have had uh, in terms of the overtime, additional PPE, um, technical changes we've had to make to some of our systems, uh, and we continue to keep close watch on that. The good suppose news in that respect is it should be largely you know capped in and around that figure because we are now seeing ourselves back at the delivery of full services and cost recovery associated with that. Um, the impact in terms of uh, recruiting additional examiners. I mean, we have budgeted for that uh, in terms of 
um, you know, we 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 look at our headcount and our complement of staff, and certainly the additional staff that we intend to bring forward are in are in our budgetary estimates anyway. So that should not impact on on that position any further. Um, so in terms of service delivery, we're committed, um, and it shouldn't have any uh, material aspect in terms of any of the recruitment issues. Uh, but again, we will continue to look at those figures carefully, and then the next monitoring round, we will again review the figures and put our bid forward again. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. I'll now go to our Vice Chair, David Hillich, for question. Thanks, Chair. You're very welcome, gentlemen. And I'm joined with yourself, Jeremy, and thanking the DBA staff for what has been a horrendous time for them as well. Over, I know they get a lot of complaints, a lot of hassle and whatnot, but people are sort of head up with these issues. And, but uh, thankfully, they stood their ground well, and hopefully that continues. So thanks to the staff, anyway. Uh, just on those additional test examiners, I heard you quoting some figures there, Pat. How does that compare with what you told us here at the end of June? Is that on course, or has it been cut back? Or yeah, well, it's not as good as we had hoped. Um, the first tranche of examiners that we brought in, there were eight initially, and of the eight, um, two of those staff couldn't um, make the training uh, because they, they couldn't complete their notice period with their current their current employer, and then they had to drop out. Um, one of them couldn't locate the, the, the qualifications, um, so they have to go back to their examining board to, to get the qualifications. Now, we've deferred that person's training until January, and we've given them until December to get the qualifications. Um, and of the five remaining examiners that we did train, only two of them passed. Uh, and the driving examiner training isn't easy, and I've said to um, my team that um, we do not reduce the standard um, that we're after because this is a re this is a road safety issue, uh, and so we keep our standards high. And unfortunately, only two of those that um, went through the training passed, and they have now been allocated to their test centres, and they're they're, they're currently testing. Um, so Oma and Anna Skillen have benefited from that. Okay, thank you. Uh, there now appears to be a, a sort of a warning out there in relation to renewal of driving licences, whereby there could be a 10-week delay in that situation. Is that accurate? Is that true? You need to separate, in terms of driving licences, for an ordinary driving licence, if it's renewed online, it will take no more than five working days. In fact, very often it's within 48 hours. If it's a paper application, it'll take slightly more than 10 working days. Um, but if you're talking about HGV driving licences, um, okay. then that's, that's a completely different matter altogether. Um, the HGV driving licence, the Group 2 driving licence, is a much more complicated um, process, which requires a medical. medical yes. And it's the medical where uh, the, the delay is being, um, is, is being caused. Uh, if, a, if a Group 2 driving licence holder <coughs> submits their application for a renewal, we will assess that. Um, we will review the medical forms with it, um, and our staff in Coleraine um, are um, skilled uh, to assess relatively straightforward medical conditions. But if someone has a medical condition which we cannot assess, or has a medical condition which has um, a new medical condition or one that has worsened, then we have to send that application along with the um, medical forms to our medical advisors. Um, they will then assess that. However, um, some applicants uh, require further investigations, so that then goes out of our own medical advisors to uh, a private contractor that we have, and, and in some cases that may have to go to the person's consultant, a neurologist, a cardiologist, etc., uh, for assessment on that person's fitness for dr to drive. The important thing is, is that when it leaves us and it, it goes then out for medical assessment, we really have little or no control over that process. Um, but where there is a driver who is experiencing difficulties, we will intervene, and we do have an arrangement where we can fast-track those applications for some of those drivers. But we can't fast-track them all, because if, if everything's urgent, then nothing's urgent. Um, but we, we do our best uh, to turn those around. They, but once, once it, it goes for a medical, then, and, and we have been in conversations with yeah. our medical advisors and our contractor you know, to, to turn these around because these are people's livelihoods. And also, we're very conscious of the, the shortage of HGV drivers and the importance of having these renewals turned around. I raised, I raised the HGV before. And there's so some horrific delays there, and it's due to the medical situation, which yeah. is out with yourselves. Obviously, not. Well, but David, not, not every. Um 
uh, driver will have medical conditions and we're certainly processing those applications in around three weeks. Um, but again, the Group 2 standards are higher than that of uh, Group 1 drivers due to the size and the weight of the vehicles and the length of time to spend behind the wheel. So it is, can sometimes be a, quite a protracted medical investigation required in certain circumstances. So there, there's no delay for the Group 1, as, you, as far no. as you're aware? No, the Group paper, 1. Paper exercise or paper the, the, the online, And we would encourage um, uh, ordinary driving licence holders, Group 1 driving licence holders, to renew online. It, you know, it is fast, quick, safe and secure. Um, and it'll be turned around in uh, 48 hours, and within a few days, the licence will be on the, the doormat. Um, it'll be post, it's posted from Swansea. We send the file every night to Swansea uh, for, for um, uh, ordinary driving licences. Okay, and then moving to technology, then how, how are you finding it with the? Is there a gap there for the where there's older folk or folk who are not technology literate? Go, go, you, you, I'll just raise that with another point in relation to the telephone service. Yeah. Whereby I know you're working very well with the NI Direct, and I understand there could be further refinements there. Are you taking into consideration those who are maybe not technology literate? And that sort of well, from the driving license point of view, we already have that in place because we have a you know a direct line into Coleraine. Um, people can still complete their application using paper, so there there, there is the alternative, um, and the, the application can be for both a provisional driving license and a renewal driving license. The, the paper application form can be um, sent back to Coleraine, and we in fact we do post that out to people um, with pre-populated fields, uh, and they can return that to us. Um, the NI Direct issue, Jeremy, is more, more in relation to the new. Yeah, I mean, the NI Direct issue, um, David, you're absolutely right. We've been doing an awful lot of work with NI Direct to, to improve the service for customers. I mean, there's there's essentially the, the two main channels are, are the online channel and then the, the call centre for those people that are not comfortable with the online channel. Um, there was a significant demand for NI Direct services in general, and uh, that has impacted. Uh, in terms of some of the performance uh, in, in the area of DVA services and, and query lines. So we've been working to improve that, and, and I'm glad to say that things are certainly improving in that respect. Um, as we move, I suppose, to we've, we've introduced essentially five significant digital transformation services over the last n number of years, and we recognise that as we move to digital platforms that customers will need support. Um, we had embedded digital assist teams within each of those areas, for example, passenger transport licensing. Um, so when a taxi driver bus driver wants to process their application that they engage with us and we can walk them through the process. Now, before COVID, we had planned to do that in a face-to-face -face environment, set up terminals, let people come in. And actually, in that respect, we're now uh, working with Libraries NI to see if we can, uh, you know, avail of, of their services to support um, someone who would come in and want to avail of a, an online system and, and give, be given a bit of direction using the computers that are available in libraries. And we're hoping to roll out a pilot in January, where DVA staff will be present in some of the libraries in the Fermanagh and Oma District Council area mm -hmm. uh, to support customers who are struggling with it. But again, we would also ask people to um, engage with maybe younger family members or friends to help them with the journey, because really, in truth, there's probably a fear factor there. But when you go onto the systems, they are quite intuitive and they are quite straightforward, straightforward to work through. And that's been our goal to try and sort of uh, ensure that there's a consistency of standard across our platform, so that people are familiar and know how to use the systems. And uh, we believe that they are, you know, very user friendly. And that's certainly the feedback that we've got. Okay, thank you. And just as a side issue that the chair has allowed me to ask, I did ask that we put on the agenda, but that didn't happen. Uh, taxi enforcement, which I raised with you potentially a few months ago as well. I understand in recent times there's been a court case in relation to one particular uh, issue in, in where potentially entrapment uh, was mentioned and things like that. But would it be possible for the committee to get details of that? Court case where the department seemed to lose out on things there, where maybe things weren't right. Well, obviously, I mean, there will be legal privilege around any court case in terms of the evidence that's presented, but then the outcome of any court results will be made public uh, in the public domain. So um, uh, I'm familiar, I think, with the case that you refer to. Uh, but obviously, when they're within the, the court arena, we have to let due process, um, you know, follow through and say you've you raised the issue of potential and entrapment, and I've, I've advised that you know our enforcement officers don't act in a way that any other member of the public uh, would act in terms of availing of a taxi service. And of course, if that is the challenge through the court, um, through a taxi driver who feels that that's not the case, well then it has to go through due, due process, and the magistrate will, you know, determine based on the evidence that's presented. Well, that, that case 
is this finished? Is that right on that I'm, I'm not 100 per cent sure. I mean, so there's hoping to get maybe the department to give you just an overview of what happened or potentially, because I understand there's other taxi drivers that have been in the same position as that gentleman, <coughs> and to save court fees and whatnot, they've, they've, hit, they've paid the 200 pound, 300 pound fine because it's easier to stay on the road and without getting into court cases and potentially thousands of pounds. Well, I mean, as That's you'll appreciate... That's like just where you viewed that situation. You, you'll appreciate there is a suite of fixed penalties associated with a number of offences, in, including taxis, and that was brought in when you know the last, the last uh, you know taxi legislation was introduced, you know, in around sort of 2015, and that suite of fixed penalties was there to support, um, the, you know, dealing with the offences at the roadside without going through the burden of, of taking cases through the courts. Yeah. Uh, but ultimately, there are some cases, depending on the nature of the offences, that will end up with uh, the PPS, and it's the PPS that direct in the cases we present them to them. So, you know. They end up in the court after being directed upon by the, the public prosecution service, and I say we have to follow due process. But I mean, once those courses, uh, th those cases are heard in the courts, and there is a result of them, there's no problem in providing the information of those outcomes, uh, you know, to you. So, um, okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, could I now move to Cahill Boylan for a question? Uh, thank you, Chair, and you're, you're very welcome. And Certainly, I would, I would like to recognise the, the hard work too of the DBA over the very, very challenging times for, for everyone. And, and obviously, there's a lot of frustrations and stress out there with people applying as well, trying to get on the system, trying to get tests. And so, I recognise both of that. But ju just during a few questions I want to nail down. Um, the first four months, you conducted 23,246 diabetes from your Zoom, which is 50%. So, I see there are then the figures in, in September. Six and a half thousand, which runs at forty-one percent, and I'm just wondering, um, was was this good progress? And I'm not, I'm not saying it's not. The question is, what what's the difference in those figures? Because you've you've gone from fifty, you've lost nine percent there. Is there a reason for that, or? Uh, Pat, yeah. Quite simply, um, we we closed our um, all of our services uh, in advance of the migration from um, our old BSP booking system to the new booking and rostering system. So we closed we closed services from um, 5 p.m. on Thursday, the 16th of September, um, until 8 a.m. on Tuesday, the 21st of September. Um, and that was to de-risk the migration um, across from one system to another. And because the driving test system is done on a tablet, um, and that information is in the, in the live environment, we would, we would have been um, uploading live results into a system which was migrating between two, two systems, and that, that wasn't going to work. Um, so finally, what we managed to do was we got those examiners who could uh, continue to do, deliver um, driving tests using the old paper-based system, um, and then we released a number of driving test appointments um, for that weekend. So we did the the uh, Friday, Saturday, and the Monday, um, but that was a much lower number than we would normally do over those three days. So that was one of the reasons. The other one was annual leave. Our our staff had been working, you know, flat out over the whole summer months, and the final thing for September, we lost light around the second week in September, so we couldn't do the evening tests, and that reduced the number. So it, uh, those factors combined had an impact on our overall dr uh, driving figures for that month. I think, yes. I mean, Cathal will certainly vary and fluctuate, you know, based on staff availability, and we've been utilising staff to do overtime, and, and obviously I think it's a, a point that members have, have raised before, is about fatigue, you know, uh, how can you continue to deliver, you know, services working on Saturdays and Sundays, and then we've mentioned also about sick absence, you know, that also has an impact. Our commitment has always been to try and, um, you know, maximise the amount of um, driving tests that we can deliver with the resources we have, and we'll continue to do that, but you will see <coughs> fluctuations from one month to the next, uh, naturally because of those issues. No, and I appreciate that it's getting an explanation because, I mean, clearly all the members are getting, you know, inquiries day and daily and we're trying to address it. That's, I asked in that context, and, and I appreciate, I recognise that's good work. See, see now, and you, you may know that maybe this is the case where there's more theory tests, being pa there's more people now passing the theory test. What way then does that reflect in terms of the numbers that are sitting, and you may not have the numbers? They're sitting there that have applied for, for driving tests, actual driving tests. 
I think certainly, Cahill, in terms of the, the theory test conducted, I mean, there was, a, you know, again, a significant demand for that service when it resumed again on the 23rd of April. And, you know, in the first four months, we don't have the theory test figures for September, but in the first four months, certainly we're in around 40 per cent, or sorry, 40,000, which was about 79 per cent more than that um, period uh, over the last uh, previous five years. And we've also seen that the pass rate and the theory test has increased slightly. So there are more people with a valid theory test that could potentially book a driving test. But you will always have a scenario where you have people, because you need to obviously have your theory test before you can book. Right. And I think people um, are, are, are probably um, taking the theory test uh, at, at an early stage, knowing that they want to try and book a driving test at the earliest uh, point that they possibly can. So we are seeing the figures now starting to ease back. You know, certainly anecdotally, the figures for September and indeed going forward, there uh, seems to be a reduction in the amount of people that are presenting for the theory test, which suggests to me that the demand now is starting to even out in terms of your sort of getting back to your more delivery, you know, your normal delivery model. But it's again something we'll have to keep a very close watching eye on. And we've changed our theory test provider, as you, you may well know, from the 6th of September, that service is now being provided by DVSA. Uh, so they will be providing that management information going forward. Uh, but certainly there's plenty of capacity of theory tests now over the next number of months. Um, you know, I think there's circa 23,000 tests available, um, you know, and, and plenty of capacity. So we're not seeing that them being booked up as quickly, which is a sign that, you know, we're probably uh, coming out of that sort of peak demand area. And if I could just put a couple of numbers on that for you, Cahill, to um, help ease any concerns that you might have. In September, we did 4,142 theory tests. That's across the whole range of theory tests, of which 3,637 were for the private car. And during the same period, we conducted 6,441 practical driving tests, of which 5,267 were for the practical car. So we have got over 1,500 um, more practical car driving tests than we had theory tests. Um, and we, as Jeremy has said, we are beginning to see a levelling out in terms of the number of people who are coming forward for driving to, for theory tests. And as I said, you know, there's 23,400 available appointments sitting in the system at the moment for theory tests, 1,600 for November, 4,700 for December. So the best part of uh, 6,300 uh, tests between now and the end of December uh, still waiting to be taken for theory tests. You know, preach, and it's not, it's not going on notice. I mean, I'm just saying, like I said, it's just, it's just when we get the queries. Uh, just want to talk a wee bit uh, to, with your indulgence on a couple of other points. The um, average waiting times. So the waiting times between um, April and September. You're, you're talking about um, 76 days, with the longest waiting time being 110 days. And, and clearly, in, in relation to people waiting, that can mean a wee bit more for learner drivers, you know, in, in terms of lessons. So is that still an accurate reflection, those waiting times? wouldn't be too far away from, from what we're currently experiencing. Sorry, and, and just one final point, well, two final points here. Say in terms of insurance, would they be in? And we're, you know, this concern about whether you're insured or non-insured or any. Are you aware of any of that, those issues in terms of it? I've been dealing with the ABI now um, for the best part of two years since the uh, lift crisis um, and have regular contact with Alistair Ross in relation to these issues. So anything that we do, um, we do it in conjunction with the ABI and in advance and we agree our lines to take. Um, so the, the issues in relation to insurance, we haven't experienced any issues in relation to insurance, um, but what we will do if someone does contact us and say that they are having a problem with their insurance and that their insurance won't cover them um, if they don't have a current MOT certificate, we bring them in for tests in the same way as we do for people who are experiencing difficulties in taxing their car without an MOT. We, we bring them in for tests. And we've managed to do that with everyone thus far, um, so no one's been disadvantaged. And just finally, Chair, um, this, is there any disparity between the test centres in terms of testing right across the board? No. Or, no. or are they on average, even and out? Well, uh, it's, it's quite similar, I suppose, in terms of the, the answer I provided in terms of the driving test. I mean, we look at the figures and, and you know, you will have fluctuations in terms of staff availability and, and the, the regional managers are trying to, you know, make sure that there's resources in each of the test centres to deliver the service in those particular areas. I mean, in terms of the insurance question, I, I, I did listen to, to Alistair and um, the points that Pat made are, are, you know, absolutely valid. And if any insurer has, you know, an issue, you know, Alistair has said, look, you know, if you can 
put them in contact with him, and he certainly had that conversation. So I'm assuming that that offer still stands, where there is someone having a difficulty with their insurance company who who may not recognise um, uh, the, the the unique scenario in Northern Ireland. So, uh, but we will continue to keep in close contact with both ABI and the the police as we have done throughout the pandemic, and just keep them updated on where we are uh, in terms of the delivery of our services. Okay. I'm part, sorry, I'm part, just okay. it's just part of the, brought something up here which is important. Um, for those who passed the test the first time round, you know, we're, we're thankful. But for others, we have, see in terms of, because you mentioned earlier on, uh, those people who are taking the test, I mean, have you, any, have you any average figures or percentages in those who are failing? Because I know people are keen to do the test. But, but are the figures rising in terms of failure rates at first? Because that would certainly present a problem. Yeah. At that, this time, for sure, you know, I mean, if people were, were doing the that, that, that's a figure, unfortunately, that I can't provide for you because it's covered by um, official national statistics protocols. So I can only go back to the the Q1 figures that were released uh, in September for the period from uh, the 1st of April to the 30th of June. Pass fail rates are covered by uh, national statistics protocols, and our chief statistician um, would have my life if I were to release those in advance of them being no, officially no, okay, released. I'm sure it's but fair. I did think you would ask this question, Carl. So I did look up the pass Excellent rates for chair. Q1. Uh, just uh, and, and the figures for private cars was you know 63.5 percent in terms of the pass rate, which is up around eight or nine percent uh, from normal years. Which, uh, but it's too early to see if that's going to be the trend going forward. And as yeah. Pat said, you know the next next set of release will give us information for the next quarter and then we'll start to see if that is a pattern that is emerging and being consistent. The good thing about it is that you know eight or nine percent or more are passing their test and then coming out of the system and not looking for a further test. So okay. thank you. Thank you, Cahill. Uh, we now move to Cara Hunter, MLA for a question. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to the panel uh, for being here this morning. <clears throat> I have two questions. Um, just around, can you talk us through, uh, when looking at vehicle tax, just for clarity, there's been a lot of questions around um, tax if your MOT has expired. What is the current situation there uh, for tax and for drivers? In terms of, of tax, tax is an accepted, accepted, accepted matter, which is the responsibility of Treasury, and <coughs> vehicle tax is managed through the Driver and Vehicle Licensing Agency in Swansea. We have absolutely no influence over tax matters whatsoever. Um, what we uh, have done is we have made advice available to our customers on NI Direct. Um, that if they get within five days of their vehicle uh, test certificate expiring, um, then they should contact us at dva.customerservices at infrastructure-.gov.uk um, and we will endeavour to get them a test. And up to this point, we have managed to get everyone a test um, before their tax has expired. Carol wrote that down there. I <laughs> okay, Carol. <laughs> That's positive, thank you. And then just one more, just recognising that this is an ever-changing situation with the backlog. Um, what are you doing to ensure that there's clear communication with the public on this ever-changing situation? Uh, I think the communication issue is an important one, and we, I suppose, have a number of channels. Um, one of the main channels is our NI Direct uh, website, which uh, the coronavirus and motoring page is updated regularly uh, as things change, and we try and direct customers where possible to that site for uh, the range of services that we deliver. We also use social media, again, to put out uh, messages there that, uh, again, direct to key messages or changes in service delivery. Um, we engage with our key stakeholders quite routinely, uh, a number of key stakeholders, be it the haulage industry, taxi industry, um, and indeed uh, customers, and through the, through the, in terms of driving tests, the, the driving instructors, uh, and the Northern Ireland uh, Association of, um, uh, what is it, Northern Ireland Northern Improved Ireland. <laughs> Instructors Association. So, I mean, we do, we do contact um, all those key stakeholder groups to advise them of changes to our services. And, uh, but I think there's always uh, things that we can do to improve our communications, and we always look to see how we best uh, do that. I mean, some of our digital systems now have notification um, facilities on it, such as the commercial licensing system, where we can put specific messages out to, to industry. But it's, uh, it's an ever-challenging thing to do. But the main source of information would be the NI Direct website, which is updated uh, very regularly when there's changes, um, changes there. That's lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Cara. Uh, we now go to Liz Kimmins for a question. 
Thanks, Chair, and, and thanks to you, um, to the, the witnesses for coming today. I think this is obviously a, a big issue, and given all the questions. I just have a couple, um, just in relation to um, the theory tests and and the impact, then, I suppose, on, on the backlog for practical tests. Um, I was under the impression, I think it said around 22,000 people with the theory pass um, before the test resumed in April hadn't booked their practical. Just check, would that be right? And I mean, s since then, do we now have an idea of how many people now have a theory, their theory test and are still waiting on their practical? The 22,000 figure um, at that point in time was really anybody that could potentially avail of a, of, of a driving test that had a theory test, a, a valid theory test um, uh, booked. So that was to give us some sort of sense and give the committee some sort of sense of scale um, before we opened the service up. And as I've said, we, we um, opened the service up in a phased way to uh, ensure that those people whose theory tests were coming to an end or coming closer to an end uh, could avail of the booking system before it was opened up to all others. The current figures, Pat, I don't have the current 12, figures. 12,400. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... so uh, <laughs> so the figures are, are are coming down, which is encouraging. Um, but there's there's no doubt, um, you know, it, it, we will just need to keep a very close eye uh, on the figures going forward, and, and hopefully things will start to, to normalise as we are seeing in the theory tests, and and certainly the more the more driving tests that we deliver, um, that figure will come down yet yet further. And I know, um, thanks for that. I know um, that you had mentioned just about the different things that are impacting on, you know, staff and, and I suppose instructors and examiners and things like that. Um, do we have a sense of how many additional examiners have been hired at this stage, um, or we're looking at maybe hiring more, or do you think where things are at at the minute is how they'll remain? I think it, we were running a, a competition to recruit um, full-time examiners, and during the period when we resumed services, we've been focusing on getting our dual role examiners, um, our additional dual role examiners, up to deliver the service, particularly over the summer period, uh, and maximise that, particularly at a time when vehicle testing hadn't resumed at normal capacity. Um, as Pat explained earlier on, we have run a recent uh, training course where, unfortunately, uh, only two were successful. We have another driving examiner training course which starts next week and that will take us up to the mouth of Christmas and we hope that the return on that training investment um, we get uh, more through uh, through the training and then we have a further course um, that is scheduled for the 10th of January. Um, so we have a continued commitment and obviously there's some logistics around booking that, making sure the trainers are available, trying to manage leave and trying to make sure that we have the, the right people to, to come forward for training. So we have training scheduled over the next couple of months and we hope that that will certainly bolster the figure. Um, but as I say, the additional resources we brought in initially while we worked through the recruitment process for the full time was um, making sure that we had more dual role examiners trained to uh, provide the flexibility of service that we needed at that time. Okay, well, thank you, Jeremy. I suppose just in light of, Chair, of the, the climate change conference that's been happening um, over the last number of days, and we have obviously a report on, on decarbonisation in, in, in our next briefing. Um, I just wanted to ask a wee bit around the um, the, the, the lack of a proper smoke test for private cars and like like good vehicle as part of the vehicle test. And um, can can you give any sense of when the earliest you see the EVA taking on a proper diesel smoke test for private cars? And do we have any um, idea of the environmental impact of not having this test at, at present? We have no uh, information in relation to the environmental impact. Um, our quality monitoring is carried out by the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs um, through their air quality unit. Um, it's not something that we would, uh, we would have um, information on. Um, in relation to the emissions test, um, emissions testing is carried out in all vehicles that are 3,500 kilograms and above, um, so it's a fully compliant test. Um, there's a, a, a petrol test for petrol cars. And the only test that is not fully compliant would be the diesel emissions test, although what we do is we have a visual test, which is one part of it, and then we also have 
an examination of the, man, the malfunction indicator lamp, which if it is illuminated during test, it, it indicates to us that the uh, engine management system um, has detected a problem which may or may not be related to emissions, and that would be an item of failure. And we have failed, I think, over uh, six, 7,000 vehicles uh, since we introduced that uh, about a year ago or so. Um, we are currently in the process of building the new test centre in Hydebank. Um, it should open in uh, September, October of next year, and it will have uh, a fully compliant emissions test um, in all of the seven lanes for light goods vehicles. Uh, and then by December of 2023, um, we'll be opening another test centre in Molusk, again uh, built to the same design as the Hydebank test centre and fully compliant. And then there would need to be a significant capital investment to rule that out across the remainder of the test centres. Okay. Well, thank you. Just to finish, I'm not sure, um, I, because I was going to ask about the Hyde Bank Centre. Um, do we have an idea then how many cars would be covered by the new centre? And it's good to think, it's good to hear that there's there's actually future plans as well in terms of other centres. And you mentioned there, I think, um, the number of cars that have failed um, the emissions test recently. I just missed the figure. Uh, between six and seven thousand have failed uh, on the malfunction indicator lamp, um, so it's called a mill light. Uh, so they would have failed on that, and then they would have to go and have that um, analysed and potentially then uh, repaired by the uh, the garage. In terms of the capacity for Hyde Bank, um, we're operating at the beginning when we open up Hyde Bank with a capacity of a hundred thousand vehicles per year, but we can scale that up to one hundred and sixty-six thousand light vehicles. Okay, that's great. Thank very you. much to you both. That's very comprehensive. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We now go to Roy Beggs. Firstly, in terms of uh, driver testing, you've indicated you uh, increased your capacity by about 45 per cent, but there was almost a year when there was no test. So is that going to take two years at that level to remove the backlog? What's, what's your target for removing the backlog to normal waiting times? I was actually looking at that, Roy, because you've asked that a couple of times, and I've been, uh, we've uh, been looking at the figures. We've been looking at the figures that, to, to try and give some indication as to when we would do that. If, if we're consistent uh, and we're, we, we manage to get um, uh, around <coughs> 70,000 uh, tests, between 70 and 75,000 tests done in a full financial year, um, then we, we're probably looking uh, towards the back end of, of next year to get everything uh, cleared, if, if, if you're thinking about a backlog. Um, but it all depends on what's coming into the system. And the other thing then is the capacity of the ADIs to actually progress their, their candidates to put them forward for tests. So there are a number of throttles in the system. Our issue is, is to trying to get the balance right between the demand for testing and a reasonable waiting period and um, the number of staff that we have. Because what we don't want is on-demand testing because we find then during the winter months when driver testing is normally very low that we will have a resource that will not be used. That resource, if it's not used, will fall foul of the third directive. And we then have to put those uh, driving examiners through training to maintain their skills. So it, 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 it's getting that balance right. Uh, and we're, we're still working through those figures to see exactly when, you know, if you're thinking about how you, how you define backlog, when that would be uh, resolved. But it, it's not an easy thing. Uh, examining, examining the overall picture, uh, <clears throat> you've mentioned that you had some staff out in <clears throat> long-term uh, illness. Others have retired. Have you looked at what the likely uh, situation will be ongoing, so you're building that into your... Uh, recruitment policy? Yeah, yeah, we, we have a workforce planning uh, unit and our workforce <coughs> planning unit look at projections in terms of staff who are going to retire. Um, it's very difficult to assess in terms of, of sickness and, you know, and recently we have had an, uh, uh, some staff who have uh, had very, very <coughs> serious illnesses that we hadn't anticipated um, and we have to factor that in. That, that, you know, it's unlikely that they'll return to work. Um, you know, so we'll, we'll, we'll have to factor those in. But the, the important point for us at the moment is that we are in a supply position because we've recently run a number of external competitions. Those competitions have um, a number of people on, on the lists that we can draw off. So it's not as if we have to go back out for recruitment. Those, those, those lists exist for us to draw from. In terms of HGV driver testing, and uh, HGV drivers are important to get food on, on our shelves and, and the overall efficiency of, of the economy. Um, are, the, are, are commercial testing, is it still being prioritised? 
meet the needs of the economy? Yes, uh, prior it, is, it is being prioritised. However, um, we are now beginning to see uh, uh, LGV driving tests being cancelled or not being taken up. Um, and in the last three weeks, uh, 15 of those driving tests were not taken up by training schools. We released them then to the uh, short notice appointments. Uh, a couple of them were taken up. We then had to redeploy those examiners to do other tests, category B tests or B plus E tests. The difficulty there for us is that the LGV test is 100 minutes long. The category B test is 60 minutes long. We lose 40 minutes. So you know, we, we end up in a very inefficient <coughs> position. So that the, the suggestion from that is that we are possibly now at the cusp of uh, addressing what would be the backlog in terms of LGV uh, testing, but we need to monitor that over the over the weeks to come. In terms of MOT testing, then uh, um, you, you're, you've indicated that you're at 96 percent capacity in August and September. You know, certainly at the end of or the beginning of September, I think there was a two week, uh, two month. Of solid booking before you could get a slot. What what a length is that uh, period of solid booking in advance when someone goes online to to get a a, a flexible appointment? What's the current situation? The current situation is um, that we have driver. We, we open we open the vehicle testing slots three months in advance. Um, so you will be able to book a test any time now up until the end of January, and um, the, the examiners will now be opening up into the beginning of February. Uh, and what we ha every single day we release additional slots um, because we carry additional capacity in test centres to cover uh, sick absence. So if someone were to ring in a short notice sick absence, the spur person is then able to fill in so that we don't end up having to cancel tests. Whenever the test centre manager is um, confident that all the staff that are due to turn in on that day have turned in, um, he then opens up the spur person, um, which gives another 30 tests per day, and we factor those into the lane. So, depending on the size of the test centre, will depend on the number of spur staff that we carry. There's a lot of pressure on your staff. There's a lot of pressure on your administrative side in this model of having to juggle, juggle and, and not allow uh, customers to pick dates that suits them within their their period. So, I, I recognise there's a lot of pressure on your your uh, staff uh, on this current system. So, in terms of moving forward, um, there's a current there's a consultation out in terms of uh, reviewing the frequency of MOT testing. So, my question around it is: Can you provide us with figures as to the number of uh, vehicles that are uh, failing their MOTs, which are three-year-old, five, four-year-old, five-year-old? Because uh, in many other countries, newer vehicles are not tested every year. Do you have such figures available that we can consider? We certainly would yeah. have those figures available. I don't have them with me now, Roy, but I mean we've looked at those figures before. And in terms of um, when vehicles uh, are beyond 10 years uh, old, then there is a bit of a tail off in terms of the the vehicle test pass rates. Um, it's something that we obviously are watching closely now in terms of the trends of vehicles that haven't pre presented for tests uh, during the pandemic because of the temporary exemption certificates. What has the impact of that been in terms of people not you know, regularly servicing their vehicles? But again, we don't have the, the statistics that are published in a way that um, give us the trend and pattern of that, but certainly that is something that we will be looking at closely. And we're certainly aware of the call for evidence that has been put out by the department. I think the returns were um, yeah, it, the call for evidence consultation finished on the, the 19th of October. So I know officials will be pulling together that information for the minister to consider going forward. So it's uh, you know certainly a valid point, and that information we we will have available through our through our. our I'd be useful to see because that would be one means of taking all this pressure off uh, uh, drivers and off your staff who are having to juggle with reorganising appointments using a, a, a personal intervention rather than customers being able to manage the appointments themselves? Yeah, that would be a policy decision at the moment. We're oh, no, but I'm asking for the information yeah. to help okay. us uh, yeah. consider yeah. it. Point, point, points been noted. Okay, thank you. I, I'm going to George Robinson just in case he has a question because I know he, d he may have trouble indicating. George, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I do have certainly do, Chair, and uh, thank you very much for letting me in. Um, my, my question would be parochial. It's in relation to the uh, Coleraine MOT, MOT Centre, and I was just wondering about the, is there much of a backlog there, and have you got the full complement of um, examiners? 
Um, there's, there's no more of a backlog in Coleraine than there is in any other test centre. They're roughly in and around the same. It all depends on staffing and sickness absence. Um, in fact, in terms of Coleraine for driving tests, Coleraine is actually one of the better areas um, for, for driving tests um, in terms of our, our figures. Um, and in terms of examiners, um, we've had some movement in the Coleraine um, test centre recently where there have been promotions um, and some staff been off sick, but we're we're shoring that up with uh, new staff coming in um, and the staff that we're recruiting. They will be allocated to Coleraine Test Centre to make up for that shortfall. That's great. One other observation that uh, has been mentioned to me is that uh, people are ringing in looking for a test, and it's, it's taken ages, whereas they can go, you know, to the test centre and. They're taken much more quickly. Is is that factor? T test centre counter services remain closed um, as a as a result of COVID. Um, so there is no means by which you can book a test at a test centre. You can only book the test either through the online facility or online. via the call centre on NI Direct. Yes. Well, uh, just something has been mentioned to me that some people has went there and um, has able to book the test. Much quicker. So, Don't you be giving away I'm the trade sure secrets of Coleraine in here, George? Hey, George. <laughs> but George, I, I'd be having a look at that when I get back to the office. Uh, Please don't. Our, our North Coast correspondent <laughs> <laughs> is looking for a positive news story. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Look, uh, that was longer than we had anticipated, but we thank you for, for bearing with us. Um, I suppose probably, and just in summarising, uh, and I think members would be interested to know, you know, can and we receive uh, the figures for the, you know, staffing numbers uh, and sickness numbers right across uh, DVA pre and post pandemic, just so we can get our heads around that uh, issue going forward. Uh, so look, thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, sure. and we wish DVA well uh, as they continue to tackle the, these very serious issues. So thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Okay, members. Thank you for that, and I do know it did go a wee bit over time, but I think it was was useful. Um, I think Roy's point is pivotal too. As we go on to our briefing on the biannual MOT testing, some figures from the department and from DVA would be useful. Um, also, probably I think what would be useful as well is that we ensure that in that period of call for evidence, that um, vehicle examiners. We're given the, the opportunity and the chance to feed in as to what their experiences have been. I'm quite, I'm, I'm quite aware of the fact that we've heard a lot of uh, eagerness from, uh, from the, the general public in relation to this biannual model, uh, and I suppose that's something we can scrutinise further down the line, but it's equally important that we hear from people that are at the code face to ensure that the quality of testing is not compromised and vehicle safety is not compromised either. So I think we could put that in a note to DVA to ensure that those um, testers were given the opportunity to feed in, or, or if not, that they will do at a later date. And Roy's point re regarding figures uh, surrounding fails, etc., I think would be crucial as well. Okay, members, uh, I take it everyone's content with the briefing we've received. There's no follow up. We could actually also do a follow up on David's point in relation to the enforcement issue. I think there is some, some information there that the Department could come to the committee with regarding, I'm not aware of the court case in general, uh, but in, in relation to the, the wider issue of enforcement and what the, the approach has been from the Department and has this case potentially compromised that. I think that would be useful information for the committee. So the committee would be content with that. Uh, those action points from that briefing, agreed? Agreed. Do you want to point? Yeah, just another point. I mean, it wouldn't be any harm to get, um, whether it be monthly figures or whatever, just to keep of tracking your know, driving tests. Um, yeah. And what you know, the theory tests, because yeah. then we know how they're how they're actually meeting the targets or yeah. No, that's how this that's has been addressed. You know, monthly update. Yeah, we we'll get a monthly update, Absolutely. just or even a written update, and if the committee then, yeah. obviously, this is an ongoing watch for the committee, and we will be watching closely. So, if given the opportunity, we can watch in those monthly figures, and then if we need a further evidence session, we can we can get that. Okay, members, thank you. We're now going to move on.
uh, to agenda item number nine, which is a, a briefing from the Assembly Research and Information Services on the frequency of MOT testing. I'll turn members' attention to page 154, the Assembly Research and Information Service frequency of MOT testing. Can I advise members that the researcher has brought to the committee's attention that there is an error on his original paper and a revised paper is tabled in your tabled papers. Uh, the researcher will comment on the revision. So can I welcome attending via Starleaf? I think he's going to be our star witness for this next couple of sessions. Uh, uh, Mr. Desmond McKibben in the Northern Ireland Assembly uh, Research Officer. So I advise members that the committee will move into closed session for the consideration of the draft report. But firstly, before we go into that, I think we're in a position that we can hear in relation to the frequency of uh, testing uh, briefing paper. I'm right on that. We're, we're still in open session for that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Go on ahead, Des. Okay, thank you, Karen. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. Kids, can you see the slides okay? Yes, yeah. We can indeed, yes, yes. That's great. Okay, yeah, so this morning, uh, just really a short presentation on the paper looking at frequency of MOT testing. To start off with a bit of background, as you, I'm sure you're all aware, um, all cars and motorcycles are subjected to a roadworthiness test, or as we call it, an MOT test, every four, or from four years old and then every year thereafter. Like good vehicles are taken a little bit earlier, three years. And the purpose of the test really is to check for the, the technical elements of the vehicle to ensure road safety and to ensure that the, there aren't um, sort of harmful emissions that could harm the environment. In 2021, the department issued a consultation that has since closed, um, looking at changing from annual uh, MOT testing to biannual for um, private cars and light vehicles, and also from reducing or from increasing the first test date for a uh, LGV from three years to four years. So sort of harmonising LGV and private vehicles testing um, schedules. So the regulatory framework for um, MOT testing is based on EU directive, uh, and that continues to be the case even after Brexit. And the standards applied from the EU directive are are featured in various different um, pieces of uh, Northern Ireland legislation, Northern Ireland specific legislation, and they're listed there. I don't really um, need to go through them unless anybody wants me to address them. Um, specifically looking at the frequency of testing, the directive sets a minimum standard for the testing of vehicles and it applies to a number of vehicles, basically any vehicle that can, is capable of travelling more than 25 kilometres an hour. Um, and it sets specific minimum testing frequencies for each of those vehicles. Um, just looking at passenger cars and LGVs in particular, it, the, minim, the sort of minimum standard is that they must be tested from four years old and then every two years thereafter, which is in line with the proposal from the department. <clears throat> that we, um, there are some specific situations where a car might want to, uh, what, the way they said, it might, test might want to be brought forward, maybe if a car has been involved in an accident or it reaches a specific mileage. I think the, the directive calls for 160,000 miles, but. You know, as we, as we get to later in the presentation, some member states have, have done this on an age basis, like after 10 years, increased to annual testing. In addition to the time scale and the frequency of testing, there are a number of other common requirements from the directive that look at that specifically that is testing centres. So each member state must authorise a testing centre. As you know, in Northern Ireland, we have um, DVA operated testing centres, which were just addressed in your previous presentation. Um, whereas in, the, in England, for example, they have approved um, garages that can also offer MOT tests. The inspectors that carry out these tests must also um, meet competence criteria and be free from any conflict of interest. All, all the tests work on a, on a common framework in terms of identifying deficiencies, so there are minor, major and dangerous. And the major and dangerous um, deficiencies lead to a ban on the vehicle being used until the problems are rectified. And each, each member state must also um, issue a roadworthiness certificate, and these must be recognised across um, member states also. Um, I'm just going to just look now really at the, um, the frequency of each of the countries. So, put in the table here, you can see in, column, in the left column. Um, I have uh, 
um, and Paul Garrett looks at more cars in this column and looks at um, uh, light vehicles. The 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 area that are, that the chair referred to at the start of the meeting really was in re was in relation to the frequency of testing in Ireland. The main initial paper I had this down as a one 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 for M for passenger cars and um for commercial vehicles, but it was Ireland has a Ireland follows a four four a four two two basis or four two two schedule for their testing. This basically means that for the first test takes place at four years and then it takes two takes place every two years thereafter. Um Ireland then from ten years increases the frequency to one year so you could call it a four two two one if you like. And that applies as you can see down the you know, most I suppose the majority of the countries listed in this follow that four four two four two two minimum standard, including places um you know, like um sorry, four two two um Ireland, Italy, um, Portugal. There's 16 in all of the of these of these areas. Follow the 422 standard just for comparison. In GB, at the minute, it's 311. But basically, the first test um, takes place from three years and then annually thereafter. Um, sorry, excuse me. Um, and that's that's really um, that's really all. The, um, all the information I have, as I say, it was only a short paper and a short presentation, but I'm happy to take any questions. No, I appreciate, appreciate that. Des. Thank you very much. I think uh, the table is particular. It was of particular interest. It's like football formations. Uh, <laughs> so, so look, uh, thanks very much. I think it's notable there that the majority of particular of the European countries that 422 is a, a model that that's used uh, a lot across the board. So uh, I think probably going forward. It's good that we have this model to see how other jurisdictions do that, uh, and perhaps, probably down the line, you know, we could hear evidence as to how that has, when those changes happened. In fact, maybe that would be a useful thing, go, you know, in the future, maybe an indication as to when they moved to a 422 model, and if there's any particular countries that moved from the 311, which is currently in action here, uh, to the 422, uh, and was there any subsequent problems? And uh, in, in, in that change, uh, but I think it's it's very very interesting to see that that a lot of them have. So look, the, the report members has been largely for noting. I do see Liz Kimmins, Andre, so we'll take her in for a question now in a moment. But uh, uh, members can realise that we're probably at an early stage in this. That this paper was pure, purely uh, because members requested uh, a comparatory note with other jurisdictions, which I think it has been most helpful in achieving. So I'll go to Liz for for a question for on on the report if she has one. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Dad. So that, it's very interesting. I suppose it was just a, a quick question to see if there anything in the research around um, you know those countries that did move to less frequent tests and was there any great road safety concerns uh, raised? It may, it may not have come up in the research, but just want to ask the question. No, um there there uh, you know I did look briefly at the road safety record, but if you look at the if you look at the countries that do use four two two, um like Ireland, um France, um Finland for example, they are countries that have among the highest um you know the best records for road safety in the in in, in the European Union, um, so I don't think there's any real direct um, correlation between you know test frequency and road safety at the minute. You know, um, certainly I don't think you can say that 422 has had any negative impact, impact anywhere. As I said, there are some countries like Ireland, for example, that have that safety net in place. Where I suppose, like the last speaker spoke about this morning in their presentation, that maybe defects increase after 10 years, so they move from biennial to annual testing after that 10 year period which is maybe a safety net where that's where they start seeing the most faults and i guess they've taken note of that and you know and changed their testing regime appropriately so maybe something worth considering um but no i mean i can i can do a further report a further report on road safety if if the committee would find that helpful you know on looking at the road safety across the member states and the impact and sort of of the testing. 
Yeah. No, no, that's great. But from, just from my own perspective, Chair, that I'm happy enough with that. It was just something I, I, I was a bit interested in, but no, thank you. No, that, that, I suppose that's the point, Liz, that I was raising at the start. I think this was an initial yeah. comparative model. Members wanted to see what the broad picture was. Um, I think probably a, a more in-depth look at this, and it doesn't have to be immediately, Des, because we're, we're mindful that we'll still have to hear from the department and how that call for evidence went. But um, probably... For, for us, comparative models of, of countries that were the same as, as GB and NI um, to move towards the 422, so countries that had that experience and how that impacted upon you know, road safety or defects, etc. Also very interested in the Republic of Ireland example of a safety net after 10 years. I think that's something that we can, we can look at as well. Uh, provided also with the figures that, that Roy requested from DVA, so we can look back and, and see what the overall fail rate is, would certainly help us in, in gathering more information. I'll go to Cahill. Thanks, Jaren. And Des, thanks very much for the paper. And, and obviously, we, we discussed this with the Minister um, throughout over the COVID period because of the MOT issue. But the, the other side of it is that there has to be an economic angle to it as well, in terms of that model. You know what I mean? There, there may there may or may not be um, financial aspects to it in, in terms of because we're moving, we'll be moving from one year to a two year, and whether you'd increase fees or whatever that may. I'm just wondering now, you don't, obviously it doesn't have to do it now. We'll wait to see what comes back with the call for evidence. Mm. If that's the terms of reference, we're not that far, all aspects of, of introducing a model like that. So maybe it's just to keep in mind, you know what I mean? Yeah, so just looking at the financial implications of the change. Yeah. For both, for are you talking about from the term point of view of the DVA from the test uh, revenue? Yeah, because because I mean you're charging for a yearly test. Do, yeah. do, you know, do you double the fee? I, I mean, I'm only throwing it out there. For I suppose probably that will be for for us to inquire off the department. department yeah. So we can find out. Research can show what the loss would be to DVA yeah. in relation to income. Uh, but I, I totally agree with you. If you're moving to a biannual. And then just to see fees put up to cover that cost, but it doesn't make you. You would be far safer having your. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. I, I mean, it's, there's there's always going to be an element where it's jobs or whatever. Yeah, we have to. The, the, yeah. There has to be a model to deliver on, on that. Yeah. Okay. Obviously, road safety. Yeah. Uh, it, it'll be complicated because also you won't need as much staff. So Correct. actually, and then yeah, don't. people have more money in their pockets and actually can invest in other things in the economy. So there's yeah. there's, there's there's lots of yeah. Yeah. issues. Those are very be careful what we wish for, but just let's see that. No, so those are variables that that we can't obviously yeah, control. Yeah. I think for the purposes of, of days and the reporting, uh, giving us as much information as possible Scania. of comparative models. Yes. And I think also as a very very interesting concept regarding that safety catch-all. Um, yeah. You know, are other countries doing something similar? Those type of questions are perhaps what could uh, bed in for, for further evidence uh, from the Assembly Research to help us whenever we do uh, hear back from the Department regarding their direction of travel following the call for evidence. Okay, so look, members, that's everyone that has indicated has asked a question on this. Des, thanks very much for that. We're, we really understand you're staying with us now for, for the next element, but thank you very much. Okay, members. Uh, we will move on to our next uh, briefing, which is a committee inquiry into the decarbonisation of road transport in Northern Ireland consideration of draft report. Can I advise members that the committee will move now into closed session for consideration of the draft report? Okay. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Okay, members, can I advise that we are back now in open session? Uh, so we're still looking at our um, report. So can I ask, do members agree that the cover page, content pages, powers and membership stand part of the report? Are members agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Do, do members agree that the executive summary, including amended uh, recommendations, stand part of the report? Agreed? Agreed. 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 Do members agree that chapters 1, 2, 3 and 4 stand part of the report? Agreed. 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 Do members agree that the appendices stand part of the report? Agreed. 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 Do members agree to publish a copy of the report on the committee web page? Agreed. Agreed. Do members agree to forward a copy of the report to all departments for a response to the recommendations? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Agreed. Thank you, members. Uh, so we are stage now. Do members agree to table a motion uh, on the inquiry for a bit? I think that there is an agreement that we table a motion, uh, and we have a couple of potential motions uh, on the table. Uh, so, I will 
go firstly to the original motion uh, that was suggested. Members, bear with me for one moment. So we have a proposal. I, uh, we had three proposals that were submitted to the committee. We had a proposal from Andrew Muir, uh, a proposal from Roy Beggs, and a proposal from myself. I would remove my proposal uh, from uh, consideration. Uh, and I know now that we have two plus the original that stand part. So, Roy, I'll go to you. You have indicated you were. And the proposal that I have. Hold on, it's, it's not a, we're not in the decision making. All right, okay. So. In, in the proposal that I have submitted, I, I, I can see it would benefit from a slight alteration um, after the word report if we were to add as a fair contribution and then to continue to meet the and then add the, also the word UK Climate Change Committee and then read on as is uh, Climate Change Committee's goal of achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2050 or, or earlier. Okay, so that motion would read that this assembly approves the, um, approves the report of the Committee for Infrastructure and its inquiry into the decarbonisation of road transport in Northern Ireland and calls on the Minister for Infrastructure and our executive colleagues to implement the recommendations contained in the report as a fair contribution to meet the UK Climate Change Committee goal of achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2050 or earlier. Uh, and uh, there was the original um, motion that was on the table. I, I think, Cahill, you wanted to come in? Yeah, Chair. Obviously, um, we were in support of the original motion. I mean, yeah. obviously, you'll put it to the floor. You'll be reading that out as part of the sequence, yeah? Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah. So I'm going to get the original up here. Hold on, because it's not included. I don't have table papers. So I think I have it here now. Hold on. No, I, I don't. Is this right, the Andrew Muir proposal? Pardon? The Andrew Muir proposal? Yeah, I, I'll uh, also read in the Andrew Muir proposal and we'll yeah. then read in the original. So the Andrew Muir proposal was that this assembly approves the report of the Committee for Infrastructure and its inquiry into the decarbonisation of road transport for Northern Ireland and calls on the Minister for Infrastructure and our executive colleagues to implement the recommendations contained in the report to work towards the goal of achieving net zero uh, carbon emissions in line with com uh, targets set in uh, climate change bills to be passed by the Assembly. That was Andrew's motion. And the original motion, if we can get that up um, for before the committee, because it would be useful to, to read in as well. And we can get it here now. Members, it's just some technical issues. Do you have the original? Okay, the original motion text that I have in front of me, members, and uh, can correct me if it's not accurate, which was that this assembly approves the report of the Committee for Infrastructure on its inquiry into decarbonisation of road transport in Northern Ireland and calls on the Minister for, for Infrastructure and our executive colleagues to implement the recommendations contained in the report to work towards the achieving goal of achieving net zero uh, carbon emissions by 2050. So I'll take the original first. So okay. do you have a proposer for the original? I'd like to propose, sir. Cahill Boylan has proposed. We don't need a seconder, but do we have agreement members on that? I sense we don't in the room. So we, we, no. we will have a vote on, on that particular motion. So, sir, but, uh, sir, do you not take amendments before you go to main motions? Yeah, well, procedurally, we we have two motions that we have three proposals. We have the original, we have your own, Mr. Beggs, and we also have Andrew Muir. So, uh, by process of elimination, I'm taking the original motion first. Uh, so, can we have? We had a proposal from Cahill Boyle. Uh, members in a, in agreement with that proposal, please raise their hand. Okay, so we have Liz Kimmins and Cahill Boyle. Okay. And those against, please raise your hand. So we have myself, 
David Hillage, Roy Beggs, Cara Hunter, and George Robinson. I think is he had. Okay, so that motion yeah. falls. We'll now move to. Uh, will we take Andrews? Because it was in next, actually. So we have Andrew Muir's proposal, which I read to the members. Do we have anyone to propose that recommendation? We'd, well, we'd be willing to support it, Chair. Is it appropriate that we. You can propose. You can yeah. propose it. Yeah. So we're proposed by Cahill Boylan. Uh, all those in favour, please raise their hands. So we have Cara Hunter, Liz Kimmins, and Cahill Boylan. All those against, please raise a hand. We have Roy Beggs, David Hillage, myself as chair, and George Robinson. Okay, so that motion falls. We then have Roy Beggs' amended motion, uh, which has been read in. So, uh, do we have a proposal for Mr. Beggs' proposal? I take it <laughs> from Mr. Beggs himself. So, we have a proposed, and uh, could we have all those in favour, please raise their hand. So we have Roy Beggs, David Hillage, Jonathan Buckley, and George Robinson. And all those against, please raise your hand. We have Cal Boylan, Cara Hunter, and Liz Kimmins. Okay, so that motion is carried, and that will stand as the committee motion. So members are agreed that that is the committee motion. Okay, thank you, members, for your help and indulgence on that particular uh, report. Okay, members, we will now move on to agenda item number 11, which is the forward work programme. Can I draw members' attention to the proposed draft work programme at page 202, the draft forward work programme? Can I also advise members that further to the committee's wish uh, to plan external meetings, uh, right bus were approached to host a meeting. However, due to restrictions, we are unable to do so. Therefore, the committee staff have arranged uh, for a meeting on the 17th of November in the Tully Glass Hotel, Ballymena, for a briefing from right bus and then a visit to the right bus site. And obviously, this is very topical at the moment, given the, the significant developments that we have seen in relation to hydrogen. I have also been talking as well in relation to a potential visit which would fit in with our, uh, um, our committee forward work programme to Armagh City, Banbridge and Craigavonborough Council, ho hopefully hosted by the Council, in relation to the, the um, proposal put forward for a feasibility study in relation to rail from Armagh City to Portadown, but also to look at broader infrastructure issues within the area. So that, that proposal will go to uh, the, the Council, hopefully. For, what date are we talking? The 10th, 10th of December. 10th of December, hopefully, which will uh, hopefully help because we've had a number of proposed visits that have not been able to happen due to restrictions, etc. So I think that the council uh, would potentially be best placed to host us. Uh, members, hopefully, will have an opportunity then to expand upon that programme as we put the meat to, to the bone. Sure, yeah, I, I have some suggestions, and it's, it's very welcome to come down in the constituent. I think it's good that we're getting back out on the ground, and I hope all the members. Can come come to to the meeting. Um, it's just shows there an opportunity to to visit other or engage with other sectors when we're on yep. the ground there. So as we're putting together the potential visit, we'll take into consideration those other proposed visits. I think you've mentioned the planetarium, planetarium and, other, and the observatory, yeah, which yeah. certainly could fit into to, to the remit. So we will 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 let the officials take away uh, or a request to, to ask will they, will they host us. And then put together a programme of activity thereafter. Thank you. Okay. Okay, members. We will now move on to uh, any other business. Have members any other items of business in which they wish to raise? No. Okay. That leads us. To, oh, sorry, Liz. Yes. Did you raise your hand? Yes, sorry, Chair. Just in relation to the um, the resurfacing contracts, we've got we got information about those that have been delayed, um, and there was a number in my own area. So it was just to see if we were able to get clearer dates um, for when work will, we, will recommence in those affected areas. I know, as obviously my constituency is one of the council areas largely affected by it. So just to see if we could maybe get that. Okay. Yes, uh, we can ask for that information. Liz. Do any other members have anything else they wish to raise? Okay. Okay, members. Agenda item number thirteen, which is date, time, and location of next meeting. The next meeting will take place at 10 a.m. Wednesday, the 10th of November, 2021, in the Senate Chamber of Parliament buildings. And can I advise members in the room that the need to maintain social distancing while leaving the meeting, and to ensure that they remove all their own paper, water bottles, glasses, etc., from the meeting when they leave. Uh, thank you very much, members. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Chamber, program signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is